Rebecca Parham, welcome. Hi, it's so good to be here. It's awesome to have you. Um, so you've done a number of things, from voice acting to 2D and 3D animation, and you've now got your own tiny production company. What kind of other things are you making right now? Well, I'm actually in this weird transitional period of making uh, YouTube my full-time career, but I do still have some client work that I'm doing, and it ranges any from anything from uh, social media consulting to animation work and illustration work and a lot of advertising. Right now I'm doing a lot of advertising, but as far as the other kinds of things that I make for my YouTube channel, it's, it's mostly animation. Um, every now and then I'll try to come out with something new and different and, you know, try some new ideas on, but mostly just animated content. I know. I, I believe you've gone to college for a little bit of this stuff. Um, where did you go? What did you major in? <laughs> a little bit of it. Well, I actually got my Bachelor of Fine Arts in computer animation, and I went to Ringling College of Art and Design, which is pretty much known for its computer animation program. A lot of very strong artists out there in the industry came out of Ringling, and it was funny because we were kind of considered the darlings of the school, and all of the funding was being pushed to us, and we were the ones that everybody wanted to visit when they were doing tours, and all of the other majors at that school hated us. <laughs> but it was, um, but you know, to be fair, we were pushed a little bit harder than any other major out there, and it was, it was what I call animation boot camp, for certain. Yeah, I mean, is that what you've always wanted to do, uh, animation and? There's actually a really, there's actually a really funny little story that I tell whenever I'm asked that question. Um, but when I was about five or six, uh, I would always watch Nickelodeon, and during their commercial breaks, they would have these thirty-second bumpers of behind-the-scenes stuff, and they'd look into the studios and the voice actors and all that. And they asked an animator during one of these, "What's the best thing about being an animator?" And he said, the best thing about being an animator is you never have to grow up. And to little Becca, at that time, you might as well have played the Hallelujah Chorus. So I've always had the idea of being an animator in the back of my mind ever since I was that young. And it just didn't kind of come to a head until I was like already a year into my first college. Yeah, so it, it did speak to you then from a really early age. Oh, yeah. Well, and storytelling has always spoken to me from a very early age, because I've always been in theater ever since I was a little girl. And, you know, when I was a kid, I would, you know, put on shows in my living room and make my parents watch it. And I would cast my sister as the secondary character. I was always the star. And I would cast, you know, our stuffed animals as all the other parts. So storytelling has always been just a part of who I am ever since I was a kid. So you've done a little voice acting. Uh, was that an interest you wanted to explore as well or kind of an unexpected occurrence? Well, it's funny because in high school, that was probably around the area, you know, I spent a lot of time on YouTube and watching YouTube videos and I found a lot of interviews with people like Rob Paulson and Maurice LaMarche and Jim Cummings and Tress McNeil and all these people that were a part of like my childhood growing up. And it was very low key kind of stuff. like. No one was being invited to cons or no one was being stalked around convention halls and all that when they would go to these places. And it was kind of like this unheard of industry. But when I really like started diving into it, I thought this must be the best job ever. Like you could show up to work in your pajamas and be all of these iconic characters that live on for decades and you never have to care about what you look like. And but it was just it was nothing that I ever really pursued on that side of the industry because I just, I didn't know how, and I didn't know if I was ever going to be good enough to do it. But it's funny because when I went into animation school, I was always getting asked by my, uh, by my fellow students to record scratch sound for them and to do their final audio for a lot of their projects. And I even had some theater folks who they would brought in to coach us on, on voiceover. They would tell me, are you seriously going to sit in front of a computer with a voice like that? Seriously? <laughs> so I guess it, you could say it's an unexpected occurrence, but at the same time, I've always had an interest in it. That's cool. Um, now, some of your voice acting work has been collaborations with a number of different content creators. How'd you end up getting into collaborations and what's been your favorite so far? Well, the best way to collaborate with people is to just kind of become their friends. Because um, the majority of my collaborations have been with people that I just kind of got to know via Twitter or YouTube. They found me, I found them just started bugging them and bothering them and we just kind of realized hey we're we're all cool people who love all the cool same stuff and it, you know just becoming friends with people and collaborating with your friends that's the best way to do it as far as as I can tell in this industry um, and sometimes I'll just get people out of the blue who I'm not really friends with who are say hey you really have this great sound can we do something 
And, you know, it's just kind of putting yourself out there that really helps you collaborate with people. But I would have to say that some of my favorite collaborations, uh, I really liked how the Adele parody turned out on Annoying Orange. Um, I play a character called Adele Meat, and the song is called Jello. And I, I got to be a parody of Adele, and it, it, it ain't every day that you get to be a queen bee like her. You yeah. know what I mean? And I mentioned earlier, you have your own animation studio. How long have you been doing that, and what sort of things do you make? Well, let's see. Um, it was a few months, or maybe about a year, after I graduated from Ringling that my dad and sister helped me file for my LLC. So I've been doing this for about three years, three and a half years now. And as far as the client work goes, it's, like I said before, if it's within my creative capabilities, I will do it. I have made money off of it. Um, I mean, I've done like animation work for kids, educational music videos, apps, um, I've done illustration work, and I've done a lot of advertising work, a lot of the graphic design for print and merchandise, and a lot of corporations, a lot of the PowerPoint presentations, um, done a lot of video editing for corporate videos, um, and I've done like social media consulting and creative consulting, and like I said before, I've done some voiceover work before, so... If, if I can do it, I'll make money off of it. Um, yeah. So what, what challenges then have you faced uh, running your studio? Well, apart from the daily grind of just surviving and making ends meet, um, I had to face like a lot of internal struggles for a while and just dealing with my own lack of knowledge and experience. Um, I had to learn how to be the business person when all I really want to be is the artist. And that's where a lot of people falter is, you know, they have these great ideas for businesses or they're a really strong artist and they just can't handle the business side of it. But I will say an important life lesson for anyone out there is that if you want to do what you want to do, then you have to do a lot more of what you don't want to do. And I mean, I have to do a lot of money management and negotiating with problem clients in order for me to do the thing I love to do. So apart from that, though, um, I had a lot of help, though. I had a lot of help doing all of this. But at the same time, I faced the biggest challenge of all, and that is I lost my biggest mentor, which was my dad, because he, he died, and he was my biggest mentor, and he helped me set up everything, and he was teaching me everything, and I, I had no idea what I was doing, and my mom was then too busy to help me, because she was also CEO, and she is also CEO now, but she was trying to keep everything from falling apart, so it was the ultimate trial by fire, trust me, but I made it, I made it out, though. I did make it out, though. Is it a challenge then for you to find clients and, and have consistent work? Um, at first it was, and it was a lot of um, putting myself out there and, you know, offering my services to people, a lot of emailing back and forth, a lot of uh, searching for jobs online and different, different websites. A lot of referring was happening, though. Like, I had a lot of friends from college who were like, well, the only person I know who does 2D traditional animation these days is Becca. So I'll send this client their way so to her, you know, I'll send this client to her. So I got a lot of a lot of work from referrals from my friend. But nowadays, it's kind of become this thing of people know me from my my presence online. So I'm actually starting to turn away work these days. Interesting. Um, so besides from just kind of surviving, what, what was your motivation in starting your studio? Well, um, I, I think everybody wants to do what they want to do. You know, animation is my ultimate passion. Storytelling is my ultimate passion. And I've, I've always wanted to make a living off of it. And there's always the road of, you know, do the normal road, which is go work for a big giant studio or a small studio, wherever you happen to land, work for somebody else. And then there's the road of going into business for yourself. And that basically looks like freelancing. Like a lot of people are very successful being, you know, individuals and being freelancers. But... I grew up in a family of entrepreneurs. Um, my dad was a CEO. My mom is a CEO. My sister is president of one of my mom's companies. And I grew up watching my parents be the boss and all the pros and cons that come with that position. So it's been a normal thing for me for my entire life. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So when I came home from school... And I was going through that rough transitional period of where am I going? What am I doing? Which studio am I going to work for? What city am I going to move to? I did a lot of work for the family businesses in the meantime. And I always talked a big talk in college. I was like, oh, one day I'll have my own studio. And <laughs> not really completely understanding what that meant. But my parents, who, you know, being who they are, were totally on board for that. 
So I come from the incredibly rare circumstance of my parents actually encouraging me to do the insane thing of going into business yeah, for myself. But it, it has worked out for you. So, um, oh, it, it has. Absolutely. And it's been a couple of years now you've been running it? Yeah, it, it's been a couple of years um, and I'm still going. So <laughs> doing something right. That's awesome to, to see, you know, an independent content creator, content creator actually uh, move into that space of being able to, to find independent work on their own. Um, so in that time, what have you learned running your studio? Oh boy, so much. I could just, I, you could have a podcast on just what I have learned throughout this entire process. But um, money management, uh, money management has been the big thing, I'd say. Um, I used to be really, really bad with money, and it took a lot of help from uh, my mom and uh, our accountant that uh, had to sit down with me and say, okay, so this is the, the dumb stuff you're doing now, and this is what you need to be doing in the future. Um, but I also learned a lot of the ins and outs of social media because, you know, social media has been this new big thing that everybody is trying to figure out. Everybody is scrambling to figure it out and how it works and the formulas that make it successful. And it's never a surefire thing. And so, you know, people come to me a lot asking, okay, well, how are you making social media work? And I just kind of throw up my hands and say, uh, it's just working. <laughs> but um, I, there are a lot of tips and tricks that I've been able to pass on to people, a lot of good consulting stuff that I've been doing for them. Um, I've learned a lot about, you know, new equipment, about good lighting and, and video and good recording and audio, because uh, we didn't really teach that in animation school. But ultimately, I would say just across the board, any business person worth their salt will tell you that it takes a level of toughness and thick skin to be in the business world. And boy, is that the truth. Um, you, you can't take things personally. A lot of people falter because they start to take things personally and you have to be pushy and demanding at times. And I, I didn't have that toughness before I went into business. And it was quite a culture shock having to deal with my first problem client trying to swindle me out of my fair pay. And, you know, I, I can't count how many times that I have been asked to do something for free, but it's for the exposure. And, you know, they kind of drill that into your head when you're in animation school. Never work for free because you bring down the value of everybody else's work. So that's fun, trying to trying to force people to understand that I actually have bills to pay. And even though I like my job, I still need money for food. Um, also, something that I learned is that everybody is going to call you crazy. Like when you when you tell your friends and your family that you're going into business for yourself, they're gonna call you crazy. Uh, so many of my friends from college told me I was crazy for going into business for myself and I, you know, I don't even get me started when I mentioned, hey, I also wanna kinda of try YouTube. They thought I lost my mind. <laughs> but it's so funny because even pushing through that was something I had to learn how to do. People telling me that I was gonna fail because people are always gonna tell you that you're gonna fail when you do something new and interesting and out of the box. Um, but now I have a fair few friends that are actually like legit fans of my work now and they follow my YouTube channel and they're, they're really excited to see the new videos come out and they work at the big studios like Blue Sky and, and, you know, DreamWorks and all that. And I think I even had one of them tell me that I was his hero. So it, it worked out in the end. Yeah, it was very humbling. Yeah, I, I definitely think it helps to have, you know, some people at least kind of backing you in the beginning, like, like, uh, you had your parents saying, Hey, go do this crazy thing. Exactly. Um, but, but yeah, there, I, I believe there definitely is a stigma kind of around, I'm going to make a podcast, I'm going to do YouTube videos, and, and people are like, what? That's not a normal job. Yeah, exactly. You know, people, it, you know, you have people who are fine just, you know, living the safe route, you know, just getting a job, nine to five, having a steady paycheck every day. And that's fine. You know, the world is run by people in those positions. And if it makes you happy, then that's what you got to do. I mean, like, my parents aren't in the business that they want to do. You know, they do it because they have to survive. My, my dad didn't want to be in the business that he was running. But in order to do the things that he wanted to do, he had to do the things that he didn't want to do. So I'm just incredibly fortunate that I am actually, like, doing something that I want to do. But at the same time, it's tough. It comes with a it comes with a level of work that people don't expect. You know what I mean? No, I, I feel like I've seen that time and time again. People on YouTube they they start out doing some woodworking thing or, or whatever else, and it becomes just a, a small side hobby to them. And eventually, somehow they amass enough of an audience that through Patreon or, or wherever else they can support themselves through it. Yeah, it's it's pretty incredible how people are are 
being able to make that transition from something that started off as just, you know, a passion project into something that is now their full-time career. It's just, it's, it's amazing the success stories. Running a company, you, uh, you clearly need equipment. What are you using? Um, well, I, I use pretty much everything from very expensive things to very cheap things. Cause you know, sometimes you gotta make the, de the decision of I'll pay the money for this expensive piece of equipment, but I'll still record audio in my closet, which is essentially what I do is, um, I, I bought the Wacom Cintiq and the Cintiq Companion because I worked with those in school and those are an absolute must for me now. Like there is nothing better to me than the Cintiq. Um, I can't work on like, uh, the, the drawing tablets anymore. Um, and I have, you know, the, just the kind of standard Yeti microphones. I have a Rhodes microphone. Uh, every time I, uh, I do a video or I need to do a video, I have a ring light. I have some soft box, box lights. And apart from that, I just, I use the Adobe suite for my software. Yeah. Pretty, pretty much standard stuff across the board, but I do record audio in my, my walk-in closet at home because I can't afford the, the you know the soundproofing foam at the moment. I can't build my own soundproof anything. So, but you know it's just good business. You know penny pinch where you can and you know spend the money where you need to. Yeah. Um, is the Adobe Creative Cloud suite kind of the standard, uh, even when you were in college or uh, different programs are kind of used? Yeah, pretty much. Um, I would say like the the biggest standard was you know Photoshop and Premiere. Um, uh, After Effects is a huge thing in the industry right now. I'd say, you know, Adobe, you know, it knows that it's the front runner for a lot of creative software out there. Um, but mostly for 3D animation, Maya and Autodesk were the main, the main programs that we worked for. And, but, you know, they work so seamlessly well with the Adobe suite that that's just, you know, the, the default of what we did. So, but it is industry standard, I would say. The only thing that I think is now starting to outshine the Adobe software for animation is probably Toon Boom. I hear a lot of people are using Toon Boom and Harmony in the industry. A lot of studios are, are switching to that because it's a lot more flexible and you can do a lot more than in, say, like Flash. But yeah, apart from that, uh, Adobe's pretty standard, I would say. It's a good place to be. What advice would you give to anyone wanting to get into animation or voice acting? Well, for animation, I would say draw a lot. I mean, draw everything, draw everywhere, practice, practice, practice. And if you don't like drawing, if you figure out you don't like drawing, chances are animation is not for you because even the 3D animators out there in the big studios are expected to be decent at drawing. And the best ones always will block out their shots with 2D drawings, you know, they'll actually like 2D animate a scene before they even do it in 3D. And, you know, they want to see strong portfolios, a strong drawing, and, and especially life drawing, do a lot of um, figure drawing, with, you know, the nude model thing. They absolutely expect that in your portfolio if you want to go out there and do that. So, you know, just draw a lot. Um, there's a lot of free info online, and if you have the capability to start animating, if you have like a cheap software or something, then just start. Start making something. The best way to learn is just to start start a project and learn from the project, you know? Just learn by doing. Uh, and then for voice acting, voice acting. Um, for voice acting, I would say take some singing lessons. Singing really strengthens the voice overall and it helps with control and it expands the variety of things that your voice can do. And, you know, also since voice acting is still acting, I would say go into theater. You know, audition for a show, take some acting classes, anything to strengthen yourself as a performer. Now, as far as, you know, getting into the industry itself, I'm a little green on that. You know, I'm, I'm not entirely certain how you make voice acting your full-time career because I've kind of gone about it in a very different roundabout way. It's just, if, if somebody happens to need voice acting, I got gotcha. you. The animations on your YouTube page cover a decent variety of topics. Uh, what's really been your inspiration thus far, and what do you think you might do in the future? Well, my inspiration in general, I would say, is just I love storytelling. I've always been a storyteller, um, and I've got a lot of really interesting life stories to tell as well. Um, and the inspiration is, you know, just kind of, you want to make animation work online, you want to make it work on YouTube, and there's been a formula that's been figured out that just kind of works, you know? 
we have some we have some rising stars coming in and you know they're they're getting all the subscribers and they're making a living off of it and with the algorithmic change that has happened with YouTube across the years that's been impossible so you it, it's really like a great little formula of storytelling and kind of putting yourself out there you know because YouTube is a very much a personality driven website as far as individual creators go and it helps if the people have like a person to kind of get attached to so you know that's just how YouTube works in general and animators have never like pushed themselves out there before they've never you know shown the people watching their animations this is this is who I am this is the person behind the voice this is the person behind the drawings and it's a really new and interesting posi position for animators to be in and I really like it because, like I said, I've always been a storyteller. I've, I've been in theater for my entire life. I've always been a performer. So I'm cool with combining, you know, the performance aspect of it and the charismatic aspect of it with the animation side of it. You know what I mean? So then what's your what's your workflow start to finish to create one of your animation videos? Well, okay, so it starts off with an idea. Um, I write down the idea in, like, my phone or on a sticky note somewhere. And then I just sit down and for about a day, I would say, like, it takes a good day for a good script to kind of write it out and kind of, you know, figure out what's necessary, what's not. Because ultimately, it's not like a vlog in which, you know, you can just record hours of footage and then just edit it down to however long you want. Because you have to create all of this footage, you have to take that into consideration. So if a script looks like it's going to be like a half hour video, that that's not going to work because you know you got to get a video out in like the next week or so so it takes a lot of like looking into you know a lot of foresight you got to look into what how much work it's going to be to animate all of this so the script is you know it's an interesting period of deciding what goes and what stays and what is superfluous and what's not and that's really difficult on youtube because i've discovered that people like it when you explain things they really like it when you kind of cover all your bases because somewhere out there someone's going to take something the wrong way or someone's not going to understand what you were talking about. And when that happens in like a large quantity of your viewers, it's just, it's devastating. <laughs> so the script is an important app, uh, important part of it. Um, and then I will record the script. Usually that takes a day. And, you know, you cut things there, you ad lib and you improv and you find funny jokes while you're just standing there in your closet recording. And then I edit it all together, and then once the once the edit is locked, once the audio edit is locked in, then I kind of separate it into pieces and start animating those different sections. Um, and just, you know, animate until it's all finished, and you make an outro slate and a thumbnail, and you make a video. Nice. Um, now, because of the time that animation takes, do you think you'll ever spread out into some longer form videos? Um, I've, I've tried that before. Like I, I'm, I'm one of the few people in this new genre of, of animated storytellers that will willingly put themselves out on camera. Like they they feel a little more comfortable being on camera than a lot of the others. I feel a little more comfortable in front of the camera because I've been in theater for so long. Um, but the thing is my face doesn't really, it doesn't get a lot of clicks. Um, cause people come to my channel and they expect animated content, and they're and they're there for the animated content. And to see my face in the thumbnail, I've discovered that doesn't get me a lot. So even if a video will be like part animated and part live action, which is helpful, you know, it's helpful to get kind of the length of the video going, but still have you know the aspects that they love about my work. It, it's it's helpful if I don't put my face in the thumbnail because, like I said, my face doesn't sell much. Well, have you tried clickbait? Talk to your doctor <laughs> if clickbait is right for you. Oh goodness, clickbait. I have been I've been told I, I am very, very clickbaity and I've been told that I'm not clickbaity at all. And I I try to be honest because another thing that people really like about YouTube is that there's this sense of genuineness and they kind of expect genuineness from you. And I don't have anything wrong with that. I I don't want to lie to anybody. I don't want to like you know, call a YouTube video one thing and it just completely lie in the title. Um, I mean, every now and then I'll just be like, I'll take the most fantastical part of the video. Like, for instance, you know, the fact that my teacher actually killed someone at one point and it was, he was a crazy teacher anyway. So I just, in conjunction with that, made the video about this crazy teacher and what I had to deal with with him and then just labeled the video 
he killed someone because he did. That's not a lie. He actually killed someone. And it's so funny to, that people will actually comment, oh my gosh, you weren't lying in the title. You, you were actually telling the truth. And I'm like, yeah, it, it had happened. And it's so funny because I, I will look at these scripts that I've got going and all of these different story ideas from my life. And they're actually things that happen, but I look at them in, in all and I think, my gosh, people are going to start thinking that I'm making this stuff up because <laughs> all of this crazy stuff that has happened in my life, you know? And, you know, a good storyteller can make even the most mundane of ideas interesting. Because, like, uh, story, Toy Story 2, a lot of the people who worked on that movie said that the script was pretty mediocre. But they've always said that, you know, a good storyteller and a good artist can make a mediocre story great. So, you know, that's... That's where I've kind of been able to fall when it comes to my storytelling is that I can I can really find the entertainment value even in the most mundane of situations. And I think any any YouTuber, any animated storyteller worth their salt will be able to do the same. How have you learned then to to tell stories from um, from life experiences? Well, it really, really helped to go into animation school. That's one thing, because a very large portion of our classes were something called concept development. And that's basically storyboarding class because in every studio you have a story department and they're the people that take the script and they storyboard everything out. They figure out the cinematography and they basically lay down the blueprint of the entire movie. Um, and they call it a, a story reel or an animatic. And it, it's when, you know, they have all the storyboard drawings put together with the scratch sound and temporary sound effects. And just kind of gives, you know, the investors and the uh, voice actors an idea of what the story is before, you know, the movie's even made. And it kind of shows what's working and what's not. Um, and I was really, really good at that in school. Like, I think that was like the, the department that I really, really sh shined in was the story department. Because when you're at Ringling, they teach you every single part of the 3D animation pipeline because that's when you need to figure out what you want to do. So if you want to, if you're really, really good at lighting, then you make a really lighting heavy uh, portfolio and reel. If you're really, really good at story, you make a really story, a really strong story driven reel, a really strong story driven portfolio. And story has always just been my thing. And like I said, I've been, you know, putting on plays in my living room since I was a kid. And theater absolutely helped that too, because especially when I was taking like theater classes in high school in my first college, we would sit down and just analyze the crap out of a script. Like, why would this character say this at this point? What is this character's motivation? Why this? Why that? And you really learn what is important in a story and what just feels right in a story structure. And, you know, it just kind of, when you do it so often and you've been doing it for your entire life, it just kind of gets ingrained inside of you. You know, it just kind of becomes, it just kind of comes naturally after a while. Built up life skill, essentially. Um, so you mentioned that Ringling will encourage you to build your portfolio where you have your skills. Is that kind of then expected that when you go into the animation, you're more capable of working on a team and, and you have that ability to, to do something really well, while others are going to have the ability to do something really well? Or... Well, because there's a position for every type of animator or every type of... Um animation artist out there because smaller studios they'll be looking for what we call generalists people who can do everything and then in the bigger studios they are looking for people who are more specifically um they're specialized in one thing in in you know in the pipeline you know they're really really good at lighting or they're really really good at textures or character design or animation and but the smaller the smaller places will be looking for people who can do a little bit of everything so it really just depends you know, where you want to be, where you want to go. And really, it's just good to know everything in general because it just strengthens, it strengthens your confidence and it helps you understand how your choices in character design or in lighting or anywhere is going to affect someone else down the pipeline. And that just helps you become a better team worker in general. But yeah, animation is the most collaborative art form on the face of the planet. So if you can't work with people, you're not going to last very long in the industry. I, I say as I run a studio of one. <laughs> yeah, but you're lasting, so that's fine, right? Um, yeah. Now, we've yeah. all seen YouTube go through phases of different content, animation being one of those things. Um, what's your take on the current state of trending videos, and what could make it better? Well, 
you know, you go to the trending page and it's no secret that the majority of the videos are from large corporations and production teams, the Jimmy Fallon show, Disney, the BBC, all of that, people who are paying to be on YouTube. And it's really no wonder. I mean, <clears throat> YouTube is a business and they their job is to make money. And even back in the day, before anyone was getting paid AdSense or anything like that, I knew this was coming. Like, I thought someone is going to figure out how to make money off of what we are doing. And that's just what happened, you know? And the, the bigger something gets, the more people you have looking at it and deciding, okay, how do I make a profit off of this? And that's just how it is. And it fuels a lot of a lot of things. Like it fuels uh, VidCon. It fuels <clears throat> it fuels people, you know, being able to make a living off of it. And it does suck because the current YouTube algorithm favors a certain type of video. Um, they favor it favors the longer form, ten minute videos uploaded as often as possible and uploaded on a consistent schedule. Anything to kind of create instances of binge watching in the viewers. Um, and when the algorithm was first released a couple of years ago, it rocked the YouTube animation community to the core. I mean, people were like, there's no future for YouTube animation anymore. You can't make independent animations anymore because the YouTube algorithm doesn't favor you anymore. Um, Ross O'Donovan uh, goes by the name Rubber Ninja online. He made a really excellent video breaking down about how the new algorithm was pushing away animators from the site because it was favoring longer form videos uploaded consistency over, you know, a couple times a week. And that's just impossible for us, you know? It's impossible for animators to do that. And a lot of people left, or they had to change the focus of their channels. And being, I think even Ross himself, he's now with the Game Grumps, which, you know, that's a gaming channel, and they can put out multiple videos a day. Um, but yeah, there's, but there's been this, like, I want to say it's like a revival of animation on YouTube. And we're getting, like, these new stars that are coming up and, you know, like uh, Jaden Animations or The Odd Ones Out or uh, Tim Tom and something else YT, they're all my friends. And they're, they're like these animated content creators that are actually making the YouTube algorithm work for them. And it's this formula that really, it's, it's not new because technically the first person to really kind of figure this out was Swoozy. And that was way, way back in the day. I want to say that was about 10 years ago that he figured out this particular storytelling formula of narrating life stories or narrating a conversation about like a certain topic to the audience and animating to it and animating very simply to it. So he's been doing that for years and just now we're starting to see this surgence of people utilizing that storytelling formula and making the YouTube uh, algorithm work for them. And it's really, really exciting and it's fascinating and nobody knows how it's working, but it's working. Do you think it'll continue to stay that way or we'll see another uh, inverse renaissance again? I really couldn't say because I don't think many people saw the, the change of the algorithm coming at, in the first place. I thought an many animators were just settling in on, okay, I can make a couple of videos every few months and that'll be okay and that'll help pay the bills. And it just completely rocked our world and people had to adapt or or die essentially and that's you know that's another business thing of kind of sniff out where change is coming and see if uh if you can adapt to it but you know it's just i i mean i personally would love to, to do more videos in the traditional storytelling formula because that is what i spent a lot of money at school to to learn how to do and that's you know that's what's taken seriously amongst my industry but at the same time, I really love this new storytelling formula. I love the fact that I can put myself out there and tell stories, funny, you know, funny stories from my life and kind of make me the, the, the butt of the joke a lot of the time. And I don't know, it's just, it's, it's really fun. And I, 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 I don't mind doing it. You know, it's, it's just, it's fun. <laughs> uh, you mentioned a moment ago that a couple different content creators who uh, figured out the YouTube thing, kind of. Um, is there anybody that comes to mind who you really enjoy watching or listening to or just in general you've learned something from? Well, I have a lot of friends in the industry. I have a lot of YouTube friends. Um, people who have been with me since before this became an option for a career, you know, because I only recently started uh, starting gaining a lot of traction and a lot of popularity to the point where I'm starting to make that transition into, you know, YouTube being the full-time career. 
but there were people who knew me way before all of this. Um, one person, uh, Dane Bodeheimer, he, he goes by the name Danebo online, but he is the creator and the voice of Annoying Orange. And I mean, I was a big fan of him back in the day, back when I was back in animation school. And I made some dumb fan art for him and posted it on Twitter. And we got to know each other via that. And he really, really was a huge support through the early times. And he was kind of a big inspiration because, like, I kept saying to myself, well, if he can do it, I can do it. And he would, you know, he'd give me advice on how to do things and what works and what doesn't work. And he's just been a big support this entire time, for the, you know, through the whole, the whole thing. But the other person, the person who found me before I found him was this, this very seasoned creator, Tomska, Thomas Tomska Ridgewell. And he's, he's very well known for his, um, his comedic shorts that he does. He's a filmmaker, he's a comedian, and he's a huge proponent for animation. I mean, he, he, uh, he's not an animator himself. He makes that very well known that he's not an animator, but he really loves animation and contracts a lot of animators to make animated content for his channel all the time. So he, he actually followed me on Twitter before I knew entirely who he was. And it made my brother so mad because my brother was a huge fan of him. <laughs> and he's like, it's like, why do you get Tomska following you in, on Twitter? It's not fair. You don't even know who he is. And ever since then, he and I have just kind of been slowly getting to know each other via social media and Twitter. He, it's so funny. My second, my second VidCon ever, um, I randomly walked by him in the convention hall and I went up to him and when he saw me, this look of realization came across his face and he was like, oh, and I'm like, hi, I'm Rebecca Parham. We follow each other on Twitter. And he's like, I know who you are. And I'm like, what? And he's like, I watch your channel. And I was just like, I, I have 8,000 subscribers. Why do you watch my channel? You know, it's like, it was the biggest surprise in the world that this creator that I was getting to know and really liking his content and really liking his his style of, of comedy and, and creating, he knew he knew my channel well enough that he could recognize me in person. And I had maybe made like three appearances on camera at that time. So his support has been really, really great too. And I've learned so much from him. And he gives a lot of free information on his channel anyway. You can go to his Dark Squidge channel. And he makes vlogs all the time about like YouTube money and, and you know, sponsorships and the different types of sponsorships that you can that you can use and and use to make YouTube a career and even like this last VidCon I sat down to dinner with him and the rest of the animation people that I know and we just asked him questions and he was very open and willing to you know give his wisdom and his knowledge and he's been a great support this entire time and then as far as animation goes, um, my new, my new little group of friends, new little compadre, compadros, um, are the animation gang of like Jaden Animations, The Odd Ones Out, his name is James, um, Tim Tom is one of them, something else YT, uh, and a lot of really like smaller but still like growing channels like um, Cypher Den, she's doing well, uh, Rebecca Chan, she's, her name's Rebecca, and she's a redhead who wears purple, so I'm like, well, one of us is gonna have to change, <laughs> one of us is gonna have to change something, so, but she's really great, she's a great little storyteller, so, like I said, it's like, it's this new, exciting front for animation, and all of these people are just starting to, like, just rise to the top and be these big, giant superstars, and I mean, like, it was, it was crazy to see how people would stop Jaden and James at VidCon this year. And it was crazy to me that people, like, I lost count of how many people actually knew me the first day. Like, so many people coming up and saying hi to me and, and asking for selfies. And it was the most surreal experience ever because I'm an animator, you know? Nobody, nobody wants a selfie with an animator. And it's just, it's it's really cool and it's really exciting. And I, I hope that it keeps going. Yeah. I certainly do. That's really cool. Uh, finally, where can people find your work? Well, you can find my YouTube channel, Let Me Explain Studios. So it's youtube.com slash users slash Let Me Explain Studios. Or you can just search my name and that will pop up. Um, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, and this is a story in, it, in and of itself of why my Twitter handle is this way, but it's at Nacy, N-A-C-I-E. If you want to 
you know, check in on me periodically, see some cool drawings, updates to the new videos coming out. I talk a lot on Twitter, so follow me there. All right. Awesome. Thanks for just spending your time here today and being on the pod. Absolutely fantastic to have you on. Thank you. You ask amazing questions, and I'm always willing to talk about what I love. That is the end goal of this podcast.